Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Phil and Julie, for sharing with us this morning. That was awesome. And that word trust was definitely for me. I'm sure it was maybe for many people, but I, like, I receive that because I've been in a season of going, what, what am I doing? And there's a lot of sleepless nights, and I'm in that 40-something space. Lots of us actually are in that 40-something space, and we're trying to figure it all out. So that was just a beautiful word. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I am going to try to say water for Africa, but I can't, so water <laughs> for Africa. Thank you for being with us here today. Do you know there are some people in this room who are so old <laughs> that they grew up in a world without the internet? I'm one of them. Anybody else? All right, I'm, I'm with my people. I mean, this is, some people don't believe that, that this time actually existed. But when we were growing up and we wanted to get the news, you didn't get it through Twitter or TikTok or Reels or social media. Like you had three places where you could go to get the news. There was the television. So you had to actually plonk yourself down in front of the TV at a very specific time to hear the news, right? That's what you had to do. Or another way was the telephone. So we had to like phone one another. And that, back in those days, the phone was actually attached to something. And you had to sit in a very specific place. And then you had to call someone up and then you shared the news and it was quite often secondhand news. But that's still, and then there was this third way, to get, and this is gonna sound so antiquated. It's hard to believe, this is so vintage, it's maybe almost cool again. But you used to read newspapers. Who can remember going to get a newspaper? Like that was like a part of life for me growing up. And actually the newspaper where I grew up was called the Belfast Telegraph. And when you would walk through the city, there were boys and girls, they were called telegraph boys, telegraph girls, probably you might know them as newsies. And I always thought they were so cool. I was like, when I, that's what I wanna do, I wanna have that job. They would stand on the street corner and they would just yell out, one word, telly. And they would do it with a really thick Belfast accent. This is what it sounded like, telly, <laughs> telly. And the streets of Belfast, when they weren't ringing out with bombs, were ringing out with young people <laughs> shouting, telly, telly. And I used to just think this was so, so cool. The word telly means from a distance or at a distance, the idea that something's far away and now it's being brought near. If it's sound, that's telephone. If it's pictures, that's television. If it's information, it's telegraph. I love that idea of something unknown becoming known, of something far away arriving with proximity into our lives, the idea of sharing information from somewhere else, from some other place, then that becoming and arriving into our world, our context, our story. Keep that idea in mind today. This series of studies in Galatians is called Good News for Everyone. And we're kind of standing together as a church during this series, and this is what we're doing. We're standing on the street corners of our lives in our city, and we're saying, tell it, we have news for everyone, and it's come from far away, but it's come near. We have good news for everyone. The God of heaven has come close. He's come near in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. He's made a way for every single one of us to be in relationship with him through his son's atoning death and sacrifice. He's given us the hope of the resurrection and now he is offering us his spirit. This is what the angels on a mountainside 2,000 years ago announced when they saw some lowly shepherds. They said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The good news for everyone is Jesus. Amen? 
Amen. The good news for everyone is Jesus. Now, what we're learning as we study Galatians is that Paul preached Christ. He preached Jesus to his churches. They met Jesus. The story that was far off had become close and personal and real. And now this group of Christians that Paul had loved and shepherded, now something was going on. They were listening to a different news story. And Pastor Paul takes the parchment and he scolds them like a frustrated parent. Now, I know everybody in this room behaved themselves as a child. Not me. I was a bit of a rascal. I um, would always be getting in trouble with my parents and my grandparents. And back in those days, you were allowed to be scolded, right? Like some of you are old enough that you can remember that. There was the belt. There was the wooden spoon. Any families do the wooden spoon? There was grandmom's slippers. Anyone get a smack on the backside with a slipper? Right, back in those days, you could get scolded. And now we're all parents. We're like, we would never do that. But wouldn't it be awesome if? <laughs> Paul scolds his church. Because if you can remember from being a child, there was getting in trouble privately, and then there was getting in trouble publicly. Like when you messed about, whenever you were out as a family, I'm sure your parents never said this, but my mom would just always say something like, just you wait until I get you home. <laughs> we got some people nodding their head. You know that exact quote. The public misbehavior of the Galatian church has Paul as a pastoral parent. He's wound up, he's emotional. And so he begins Galatians 3. It's gonna come on the screen behind me. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by means, by the works of the law, or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have Faith are children of Abraham. The past few weeks in the McCready house, we finally decided to give in and to be the sort of family who watch Lego Masters. For some reason, even though we love Lego and even though we love television, we never imagined a world where these two things could coexist together. But eventually we gave in, we started watching Lego Masters, and guess what? We love it. It's absolutely awesome. It's awesome. It's one of those shows that gets under your skin. You find yourself thinking about it when you're not even watching the TV. We find ourselves talking about it when we're in the car. Like, leg, we're become a Lego Masters family. And if you don't know what Lego Masters is, basically a bunch of grown-ups who probably shouldn't play with Lego anymore still play with Lego, and then they make all these amazing things with Lego. Now, because we just started, we've gone all the way back to season one. And if you can remember back, any Lego Masters fans here, you remember in season one, one of the challenges that the Lego Masters were given was to build a two-meter bridge out of Lego. And then they had to drive a little truck across the bridge, and it weighed eight kilograms, and the bridge had to be able to withstand the weight on the bridge. Could it do it? Now, here's what happened in the show. Everybody's bridges were so amazing that nobody's broke. So then they had to put more weight on the bridge and more weight on the bridge until the little battery in the little truck died and then they needed a new strategy. So they thought, what are we gonna do? All these bridges are so awesome. So they went to the gym in the television studio and they started bringing down kettlebells. The bridges were still withstanding all the weight and it got to the very end that emptied out every weight from the gym in the television studio, 88 kilograms and the bridge was still standing. In fact, in the end, this is the bridge that won it, it didn't really collapse. If you watch it carefully, they just kind of pushed it over because they needed to end the television show somewhere. And probably, I was thinking this, I'm sure if you saw this episode, you might have been thinking the same thing. 
we should just build more stuff out of Lego. <laughs> Most of the people in this room will have some sort of knowledge of the old Christian metaphor of Christ as a bridge between man and God. Perhaps you've seen it on a little picture in a book sometimes. Someone's maybe scribbled it on a page for you. This idea that God's on one side of the ravine, man's on the other, and the bridge in between the two is the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, his work on our behalf. Now, here's the thing. I don't love cliche, and I don't love trite, especially in matters of theology, but I do have to admit that this bridge analogy, is, it's actually a good one. It's actually a very helpful one. Now, here's the thing. If you were crossing a bridge, just in life in general, if you were crossing a bridge, you'd want to cross a good one, right? And you definitely want to cross one that could take your weight. You'd want to cross a bridge that you know gets you to the other side. Paul is teaching his church in Galatia in this chapter that we're looking at this morning, chapter three. He's teaching them that the law of God is an incomplete bridge that doesn't get them to where they hope it's gonna get them to. And here's the thing, they know that. They know that, that the law of God won't get them to the other side. It's an unfinished bridge at best. It leads to a dead end. It may even lead to death itself. So Paul bringing all these images together is kind of going, in this passage, what he's trying to do, he's kind of starting with the end in mind. He's got a goal because as he writes to his church in Galatia, he has a vision for where he wants to get them to. So he starts with the end in mind. Next year, Reese and maybe Ryan and myself are going to go to Tanzania. And we're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro to raise support and awareness for water for Africa, right? It's going to be awesome. Now, I said maybe Ryan because Ryan's waiting to see if uh, KFC weigh in with any sort of sponsorship deal. <laughs> we did have Canadian giants, Tim Horton, on board. But after last week's sermon and Ryan's comments, they're now suing us instead. So thanks for that, Ryan. We've already started planning our trek. And when you start planning a trek, you actually start with the end in mind. What are the things that you need to get to the summit of the mountain? Well, we're gonna need oxygen because you go up into the death zone. We're gonna need to be super fit. Reese has already started training on Jacob's ladder. If you go there, you'll see him. It's in Africa, so it's gonna take a little bit to get there. We're gonna to have to plan a trip. We're gonna to have to plan time in order to make that happen. We're gonna need visas, and we're probably gonna need walking shoes, Ryan. I don't even know if you own walking shoes yet, so we'll, we'll have a whip round, see if we can get $7 to get you some walking shoes. <laughs> you start with the end in mind, and here Paul starts with the end in mind, and here's the vision that he has. His goal for his churches here in Galatia and around Asia Minor, his vision, his hope for his churches is that they are communities of people filled with, empowered by, and in step with the Holy Spirit. The end that Paul has in mind is that a church is a community of the Holy Spirit. Last week, Ryan talked about the markers of an Aussie. They drink flat whites, they wear tazzy boots, they say, g'day mate, too easy. What he was trying to help us understand was that there are markers in community. For the Jewish people, their markers were circumcision, obeying the Torah, especially with regards to food and Sabbath and dealing with ritual cleansing. Paul is making the case in Galatians 3 that the markers of a Christian community are lives lived in sanctifying partnership with the Holy Spirit. The markers of the Christian community are lives lived in sanctifying partnership with the Holy Spirit. Let me explain this. Walter Brueggemann, who's a scholar in Canada, talking about Christian identity, says this. The call, the call of the Christian life is not to join an institution or to sign a pledge card. It is rather to sign on for a different narrative account of reality. That's huge. One that is in profound contrast to the dominant account of reality into which we kind of were already inducted. 
This God of the gospel calls men and women away from the bad news, away from the dominant dehumanizing values of commodity and brutality that are all around us. The calling God means for us is to disengage from the postures, habits, and assumptions that define the world of power and injustice, so devoid of mercy and compassion in every arena of life. The call is away from ordinary life, ordinary possessions, and ordinary assumptions to a way of life that the world judges to be impossible. What Brueggemann is talking about there, summed up as this, life in the spirit. A life that has the markers that the whole world can see. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, and self-control. Have you ever wondered why that's where Paul concludes the book of Galatians? Because these are the markers of a community in sanctifying partnership with the Holy Spirit. The character of Jesus in and through the community of Jesus is only possible by the Spirit of Jesus. That's why Paul's ticked off. This church had been so Spirit-filled, and now they had gone a totally different route. So here's what Paul does. He uses his words. He's such an amazing wordsmith. He uses his words in his language in Galatians 3 for his readers, that's you and me, to imagine ourselves in a courtroom. Now, I know a few of you, you're pretty shady. You know what a courtroom looks like. You're in a courtroom. And there Paul makes his case by asking six questions. This is old kind of Greek rhetoric in a way of like drawing us into this kind of courtroom environment. Here are the six questions he asks. Who has bewitched you? Did you receive the spirit by keeping the law or by believing the word? Third question, this is my own translation. Are you stupid? (laughs) Do you really think that the law can get you to where it needs you to go? Is that the bridge that gets you over the ravine? Is your experience in vain? And was it the law that led you into the miraculous supernatural presence of God? See, Paul is making his argument with an underlying idea that there's a start to the journey and there's an end to the journey. And what had happened to his church was they forgot that the way of the journey is the way of faith, trusting the word of God. It's faith. It's all about faith. And instead, they were trusting in themselves. Now, you maybe have heard this term. It's called works-based righteousness. It's a theological idea. The idea is this. You can make God happy. By the way that you live, you can get your own way to God. You can build your own Lego bridge to God by the way that you live. Paul knows that this is not true. Paul knows that the only thing that can take our weight is Christ. It's his justification. We're justified by faith. Justification is Christ's work for us on our behalf. This is the tell it. This is the good news. The gospel is an invitation to put our trust in Christ for us to put all our weight on him. Now you can feel Paul's frustration. I can feel it even as I preach this text. I feel the frustration and angst of this passage. He says this, after beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Do you know when you're having those conversations with a teenager and you just know you're not getting through? That, that's, what, that's what this is. Like, what are you doing? You know this. You began your journey in the spirit. Why would you go backwards? And so Paul does something absolutely awesome here in this kind of courtroom environment that he's created. He's built his argument and then he waits and he waits to that moment and then he calls his key witness to the stand and it's game over. In my previous life as a youth worker, the young people that I worked with were, let's just say, behaviorally challenged. They had good hearts, but their extracurricular activities were very interesting. And so often I would be called to the local magistrate's court and I'd be sitting there. My young people would be in the dock for all sorts of antisocial behavior, drug dealing, arson, car theft, all the usual. And the judge is just about to throw the book at them And then the lawyer would stand up and he would call me to the witness box and that would be his big, big kind of play 
to call me in to be a character witness, to tell the judge to see behind this behavior and to see the young person, to see their hearts. Yes, they're stupid. Yes, they're idiots, but see their hearts. This was the defense lawyer's big play. Paul's in the courtroom and look who he calls to the stand. Abraham, what a move. What a strategic play. He calls to the stand the very father of the people, the very father of Jewish identity. He calls Abraham to the stand. Guys, this is unreal. This is a one-two blow in the defense of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says to the people, you know Abraham, and you know how Abraham was made right with God. Was it by the law? No, of course not. Abraham was made right with God through faith. He trusted the word. He put his hope in the word that was given to him, and that was credited to him as righteousness. If you ever play Jenga, do you know, you always play with someone who takes the bottom two blocks out straight away, right? And so now the Jenga tower is just balancing on this one little thing and it's ready to go down. That's, that's what Paul does here when he introduces Abraham, not just Abraham as the father of Jewish identity, but he also introduces Abraham as, the, for us, the, he's the key to understanding the whole thing of how righteousness works. It's by faith. I mean, those two bottom blocks are gone and now it's toppling, or maybe even stronger than that, it's like chess. It's like that move in chess, I forget what it's called, but checkmate in two moves, game over. Because the question behind the question is this, if you are truly children of Abraham, then you would know that Abraham's standing before God was not based upon his own rightness, but upon God's own righteousness. All that Abraham could do was believe by faith in the word that he had heard. Guys, that is the same tele, information, vision, good news that we proclaim and herald to the world. It's Christ. We trust in Christ. He is our righteousness. And Abraham's the key to unlocking this entire mystery. Paul says, why, why, why have you given up? You know that, you knew this. The Spirit made your hearts come alive. You knew this. He opened your blind eyes. He broke the yoke of pride on your lives. Why? What's this conundrum? Well, the conundrum is this, that they had been bewitched. His wonderful, beautiful church had been Bewitch. You see, Christ had been telegraphed to them. Christ had been televisioned to them. Christ had been announced. That's what verse two says. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified. They, they know it's Jesus. So what, what's happening here? Well, the language is really helpful. Galatians 3, 1. You've been bewitched. That idea of being bewitched. That, that word's actually only used once in all of Scripture, and it's here. The idea that it carries is that the believers have been spellbound. Not in some weird occultism kind of way, but, but with creative language, Paul's trying to say, what's happening? What's the control over you? What is, what is going on there? Now, some scholars think that maybe it was like an otherworldly power that had control of the church. Some suggest it was just better preaching. Like, these guys were just better preachers than Paul. And so they, they'd kind of captivated him and caught, caught the church up in their preaching. But I would like to suggest to you that this being bewitched was actually something deeper, something darker, and something more sinister. And it's this, the human desire to be a part of the elite. The human desire to be among the influential the human desire to be seen as favored and special. And I'll, and I'll unpack this more in a couple of weeks, but I contend that that is the bewitching that's taken place in this church. Because you see, these Judaizers, they themselves think that they are privileged. When it comes to the things of God, they see themselves as entitled. And that is attractive to the human heart. This desire to be seen among the privileged is a trait that lurks in the shadow of all of our hearts. 
when we see this exclusivity begin to take root in our churches, we need to get fired up about that too, in the same way that Paul does. This is what Paul is doing in this passage. He's reminding the church this. The good news is for everyone. It's for everyone. The good news that's come to us, the good news that's been entrusted to us, the good news that has rescued us and set us free, the good news that's transforming us, sending us, bringing purpose and meaning to our lives, that good news is for everyone. Our job's not to keep it to ourselves, but to stand on the street corners of our lives and proclaim, tell it, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Let me finish this simple little story. A few nights ago, I was wasting time playing PlayStation with Shay, my son. PS5, we were playing FIFA. He was eight goals up to two. He was kicking my backside. I can't even get close to him anymore. And he was kind of feeling sorry for me. Empathetically, he said to me, Dad, when you were my age, what was your favorite video game? <laughs> and I had to think about it. And then I remembered, because I didn't have a PS5, I had a Sinclair Spectrum 48K. Does anyone, does anyone remember these? These like rubber keypads, and then you had to connect it to your TV, and then the games were on cassette, and you had to load them up and made all these squirrely noises and everything. And I had one of those, but my favorite game was called Paperboy. Did that, was there Paperboy in Australia back in the like 80s? And it was like, you can see the graphics, like we're not talking cutting edge. Well, it was cutting edge when I was younger. And so I actually sat down with Shay and we put on YouTube and watched a video of, of Paperboy getting played. It's amazing what people will put on the internet. This game was really simple. Deliver the newspaper. Get the news to where it needs to go. Now here's the challenge, because the game needs a challenge to make it interesting. There's obstacles, distractions, there were people fighting in the street. There were vicious dogs that would try to eat your legs. There were bad drivers. There were misplaced tires. And then worst of all, there were Hell's Angels on motorbikes. That's what made me think it was an Australian game. There were Hell's Angels on motorbikes <laughs> ripping across the road. But your job as the paper boy was no matter the challenge, no matter the obstacle, the paper boy had to get his job done to deliver the news. Galatians chapter three reminds us that one of the biggest challenges that the church faces in delivering the good news about Jesus is the bewitching power of fame and exclusivity and influence and superiority. Guys, we would always do, remember, do well to remember as a church before any of that, we have a job to do, to deliver the good news about Jesus to everyone, because it's good news for everyone. Let's pray. Sanctifying Spirit, awake us from foolishness in our thinking of what it means to be good news people in the world. Help us to portray clearly Christ Jesus to the world around us. We cannot do it without your sanctifying partnership. So Holy Spirit, we just ask that you fill us afresh today. Break the bondage of the law in our lives of self-righteousness, of our own efforts, and help us to throw our entire weight today upon Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord and our King. We just thank you today for the good news of Jesus that's come from afar, that's come near, that's arrived in all of our lives, that's arriving in Africa today through water, that's arriving in Perth today as churches across this city proclaim Christ. Lord, liberate us and set us free from the spirit of the age, spirit of fame and influence, spirit of nonsense, and just give us the true identity of what it means to be Christian in the world, to be a people marked by love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness, 
and self-control. And we would ask this all together in the strong name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. amen. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Whew, I'm wrecked. <laughs>